Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my fascination and what I study is trust. What trust is, how it works, why it's so important to our lives. And my passion, what drives my work, is trying to give people a very clear and precise language to talk about trust and frameworks to understand trust in a better way. Now, I know Margot just did a beautiful job walking us through a trust barometer, but I thought it would be fun to start with our own internal trust barometer in the room, okay? So this is a very sophisticated trust barometer. Now, the way this works is um, <laughs> I am going to ask you all to clap. Now, you only get to clap once, and you have to clap for the company that you trust the most. Okay? You have only to clap once for the company that you trust the most. I can see you all, so if you clap twice, I will call you out. Okay. So if you trust Uber the most, clap now. I'd say that's tepid, but okay. Um, if you trust Facebook the most, clap now. Now, I know that Cheryl came with 30 people, and I think... <laughs> Don't worry, it's not going to go that way. Okay. If you trust Amazon the most, clap now. I know the Amazon team are here, so they're, they're probably thinking this is all really good. Okay. Now, you've got the idea of the exercise, so we're going to do it the other way now. And I've made this quite tricky. <laughs> I was going to do tech entrepreneurs, but you know, they say know your audience and know who's following you, so I felt the politicians was a little bit safer. So the way this is going to work is you are going to boo, right, very loudly, passionately. You are going to boo for the leader you trust the least. I know it's tricky, right? So <laughs> if you trust Putin the least, boo now. Okay, if you trust Trump the least, boo now. I told you, it's like very telling, right? If you trust May the least, boo now. Boo. <laughs> okay, so why did I make you do this exercise? It's a little bit of fun. It's actually a rubbish exercise, a terrible exercise. If there's any academics in the audience, they're saying, why is she doing this? But I did it to actually land a really important point. The point is that this is often the way we talk about trust. I don't trust this person, I don't trust this company, I don't trust this technology platform. And we miss a really important point when that becomes a conversation, in that trust is highly subjective and highly contextual. So whenever I catch myself saying I don't trust this person, I have to ask myself to do what? So just looking at the companies that you clap for, you might trust um, Facebook to find your classmates but you may not trust them with your data. You may trust Uber to get you from A to B, but you may not trust the way they treat their drivers. Amazon is really interesting, because I think why many of you are clapping for Amazon is that when you order something on Amazon, you have confidence that it's going to arrive on time. And this is really interesting, because if I asked you a different question, no offense to the Amazon team, but if, I tr if do you trust Amazon to pay taxes, you may have given a completely different answer. Now, the political leaders, you can apply the same lens. It's a rubbish question, right? Do you trust Putin? Do you trust Trump? I trust that Trump is going to tweet something ridiculous at 3 a.m. <laughs> I don't trust him to negotiate with North Korea. So one of the things that I think we need to move forward with trust, particularly in relation to technology, is we need a clear and precise language. We need a new way of talking about trust. And I thought a good place to start would be to really unpack the role trust plays in innovation. Why trust is so essential for us to be able to take risk. So one of the ways I think about trust is that trust is like a conduit for new ideas to travel. Because when you think about all different products and services in our lives, they require trust. 
So the first time we all take digital pills where our doctor can tell if we've taken the medicine and it can read what's going on in our bodies, that requires trust. The first time we get in a self-driving car and we let the car take over the wheel, that requires trust. When we let our kids be babysit by a robot, when we start asking Alexa to make decisions for us, these all require trust. Now what's happening here is what I call a trust leap. So whenever you're asking someone to try a new product or service, you're asking them to take a trust leap. Now a trust leap is basically when we're asking someone to take a risk or to do something, sorry, to take a risk to do something new or to do something in a fundamentally different way. And the first time we take a, tr a, a trust leap, it feels weird. It feels scary, even frightening, because we don't know what the outcome may be. Now, the brilliant thing is that human beings are really good at taking trust leaps, especially when we've seen other people take trust leaps, we are very quick to follow. And we've become so good at taking trust leaps that we, it's really easy to forget that we're asking people to leap faster and higher than ever before. This is one of the reasons why we feel so much change. This is one of the reasons why we feel so much uncertainty in that the number of trust leaps that we're being asked to take in all different areas of our lives is completely unprecedented. So I think it's really important for people to remember what it feels like to take a trust leap. So I'm gonna show you a video that I discovered and I want you to think less about what's happening and I really want you to tune in to how this woman is feeling. So just to give you a little bit of context of what's happen, uh, happening in the video, she is in a um, Tesla. She's experiencing a self-driving car for the first time and she's talking to her son. So if we can play the video, that would be great. It's scary. Oh, this car is coming. Oh, oh, this car is, oh, Bill, this, put me back for me control it. Oh, dear Jesus. I could never, ah, ah. Oh, where's it going? God damn, Bill. Oh my God. Oh, this is so scary. My, oh, Jesus, this is my first day out and I'm, I'm about to die. Oh. I know. I really feel for that woman. I mean, you should watch the whole video. I'm really worried she's about to have a heart attack by the end of it. You're like, just take over the wheel, like put her out for misery. But the, why did I show you this video? I showed you this video because this woman isn't able to take a trust leap. And when we aren't able to take a trust leap, it's because we don't have faith in the company, in the product, in the technology behind the product. And what happens is we become stuck in a sea of uncertainty. We become stuck in things that we know. We become w less willing to take this kind of risk. Now, I want to try a quick exercise with you because it's really easy to laugh at the woman in the video, but I'm going to now all help you to experience a little trust leap. Now, in order to do this, you have to trust me, and you can trust me, I promise. I want you to take out your phones, okay? And I want you, don't pretend you don't have a phone, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not an idiot, right? <laughs> Take your phone out and wave it in the air. Right, excellent. Unlock it. <laughs> now, give the phone to the person on your left. If, they, <laughs> if there isn't someone on your left, give it to someone on your right. Right, we've all swapped phones. Shh. Okay, you don't know what you're gonna do yet. All right, the idea is you shouldn't have your own phone, so everyone doesn't have their own phone. Now, what I'm gonna give you is I'm gonna give you 20 seconds, only 20 seconds, so make it a really good 20 seconds. And I am giving you permission to do whatever you want <laughs> with that person's phone. Okay, you got 20 seconds, go. Don't stare at me, look at the phone. <laughs> I 
five more seconds. <laughs> okay. Shh. Okay, you can give the phones back now. No. <laughs> right now, I know, I know it would be much more fun to look at someone's phone than listen to me, but we're really going to give the phones back. I apologize if anyone was sitting next to their boss and there was something they did not want to see. <laughs> but I'm just going to randomly ask three people how that felt. And I don't know who these people are, so I'm just going to randomly ask them. You can just shout it out. So how did that feel, this gentleman here? You, yeah, this gentleman here. How did it feel? Great. Great, OK. <laughs> Super. <laughs> and this lady here, how did it feel? Stressful, okay. And this lady here? Curious. curious, okay. You're a bit curious, right. So um, now this is really interesting to me because this is the same exercise and they all had a really different reaction. So great, curious, a bit scary, a bit weird from the look on your face, right? Now, <laughs> I made you do this exercise for a couple of reasons. One, like, you know, we, that was very uncomfortable, and this person is sitting right next to you, right? But yet, we let people into our phones to see all kinds of things without even thinking about it, is the first point. The second point is that you fell into three distinct groups. We all have a very different risk propensity to take trust leaps, which we often don't think about enough. We assume that everyone feels the same way about giving their trust. So the first group of you, were very interesting, and there was quite a lot of you that you either pretended you didn't have a phone, I do not believe you, um, or you stared at me for 20 seconds, right? Like, you just were like, I'll just ignore this person. Um, then the second group of you, you played along, and I appreciate it, but you were laughing, you were giggling, and the reason why I think you were giggling is you were kind of a little bit nervous, because it's a sign, right? A bit uncomfortable. And then there was a third group of you, and... <laughs> I'm not going to point you out, but you, I saw you were taking photos and like messaging and tweeting, and you did a lot in 20 seconds, right? Now, I made you do this exercise because that in itself was a trust leap, and I can now illustrate to you what was happening, which is an illustration of how trust works. So forget the phone swapping exercise, it's just an example that whenever you're asking someone to trust, you are basically dealing with two variables, two factors. That there is a known state, and this is where humans love to be. This is certainty, this is what we know. And there is an unknown state, where we don't know the outcome of something or someone. The line between these two things is what we call risk. And if we didn't have anything in the world to allow us to overcome this risk, we would stay in this known place. We wouldn't make any discoveries. There wouldn't be any new innovations that we'd really try. Society wouldn't move forwards. Trust is the magical social glue that closes this gap. So the easiest way to think of trust is trust is a bridge between the known and the unknown. Trust is a bridge between the known and the unknown. It's what allows us to take risks and place our faith in unknown people and unknown things. Which is why my definition of trust is so simple. Trust is a confident relationship to the unknown. And when you start to see trust this way, when you start to view it through this lens, you start to see how it's this magical alchemy of our highest hopes and our deepest fears. That at the heart of trust is placing our faith in someone and something to take a risk around our money, around our data, around our well being and our love, and taking that risk because we believe it's safe. And that's why it's such a problem when trust breaks down. That's why when trust breaks down, that the first thing it triggers is in fact emotional. People feel frightened, they feel confused, they feel angry. So that's sort of the first phase that you get. The second phase is behavioral. And this is the real danger zone. 
People become disenchanted. They become defensive. They become disengaged. And this is extremely hard to repair. Now, a different way of looking at this picture is through the language of currency. And I found this a really powerful way to get my head around what happens in organizations. So in any organization, you have two types of currency. You have the currency of money. And money is really important, right? So money allows us to store value, exchange value. Money is the currency of transactions. And I think we're really good in business in talking about money because it's hard and it can be measured and it has an agreed value. But in any organization, there's another currency that is equally, if not more valuable, but far more fragile, and that is trust. And the way to think of it is if that money is the currency of transactions, trust is the currency of interactions. And when you look at it this way, it explains a question that I'm often asked. One of the questions I'm after asked is they say, well, Rachel, I don't understand. This company really breached our trust. No one trusts them, but yet they're still making lots of money. Now, the way to explain that is because we will continue to transact with them, but over time, they lose the currency to interact with us. They lose the currency to take us into the unknown. They lose the currency for us to fully engage with their products and services. So how do we fix this problem? How do we fix this problem when trust breaks down? One of my pet peeves and mysteries to me from studying trust is this idea. This idea that transparency is the magical cure for all our trust problems. Could you raise your hand for me if you're having this kind of conversation or have had this kind of conversation in your company, that the way we're going to build more trust is we're going to become more transparent? Just raise your hand. Okay. There's a lot of people, and it's really, really common. Now, let me explain to you why I think this isn't true. Now, just to be clear, I am not saying that transparency is a bad tool. Transparency is a great tool in many ways in sometimes holding people accountable or getting information disclosure that we really need around, say, gender pay. But transparency does not fix trust. Think about the definition of trust. Trust is a confident relationship to the unknown. Transparent cultures, transparent relationships are low trust relationships and low trust cultures. Transparency does not produce more trust. Transparency, in fact, if we need transparency, we've given up on trust. Now, one of the reasons why I think we're calling for transparency is because we think secrecy is the enemy of trust. We should all be able to keep secrets. Secrecy isn't the enemy of trust. Deception is the enemy of trust. So one of the things I think we need to change is we need a much clearer language around trust, and we need to stop relying and talking about transparency and this idea that if we make things transparent, we're going to build more trust. So if this isn't the way forward, what is? Well, the reason why I am optimistic, and I'm not just saying that because that's the theme of the conference, is that there is a whole science a proven science around being trustworthy. So you can think of these as traits. You can think of these as ingredients. These are the things that we use to assess, as individuals, whether we should trust one another. And the answer really lies in all of us. It lies in us all trying to be more trustworthy by understanding these traits. Now, let me walk through them quickly. So, it's four traits, and you can think of them as two parts. So the left-hand side are the hard traits. These are the traits that explain how we do things. And they are made up of competence. Now, with competence, you're essentially asking yourself or another person a question. Do I or does this person have the skills and the experience and the knowledge and the resources to do what they say they're going to do? The second is reliability. 
And reliability is this feeling that you can depend on someone. And this really comes down to two things. The first is responsiveness. So do they show up on time? Are they responsive to me? And the second is consistency, which is really hard. It's consistency of behaviors over time. So you may have experienced this with your own teams, you know, where someone shows up on a Monday and they're absolutely amazing, and on a Tuesday they're a completely different person. Not great for trust. So competence and reliability are the how traits, and the why traits are made up of empathy, which is really how much do I feel like this person cares, and integrity. And integrity, if I had to pick one, Oh my God, that was so ominous. Integrity is the most important trait, right? I think that's telling me to get off the stage, but I'm going to just finish. I've got one more minute. Integrity is the most important trait, and integrity is about alignment. Do my words align with my actions? And are my intentions aligned with yours? And this is where so much of trust breaks down around a misalignment of intentions. Now, I think once we understand these traits, we get this clearer language, and we're able to do three things. We're able to look in the mirror and be really honest around how we ourselves can be more trustworthy. Two, we can look inside our own organizations and get far more precise about where the real trust issues lie and how we can change our behaviors. And three, we can make smarter trust decisions about where we choose to place our trust in other people. Now, this sounds really easy, but it's really hard. And the reason why it's hard is like any currency that we value, it needs time, and it needs care, and it needs investment. And the reason why this is so hard when it comes to trust is that we are living in an age of trust on speed. And one of the things that we all need to do is to slow down. Efficiency is the enemy of trust. Trust needs friction. It needs us all to seek the right kind of information to ask, is this person, is this product, is this company, is this piece of information, is it worthy of my trust? And each time we go through this process, we are taking responsibility for preserving what I think is society's most precious and valuable currency, which is trust. Thank you very much. Thank you.